Good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the 19th meeting of the Justice Committee in 2015, asking everyone to switch off mobile phones and electronic devices in the interview with broadcasting, even when they're switched to silent. No apologies have been received. Item 1. I'm inviting you to agree to consider items 4, consideration of witnesses in relation to the Community Justice Scotland Bill, and 5, consideration of the evidence received on the inquiries into fatal accidents and sudden death Scotland Bill in private. Are you agreed? agreed. Thank you. We now move to stage two proceedings on the Prison Prisoners' Control of Release Scotland Bill. I welcome Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for Justice and Officials for this item, Philip Lamont, Head of Criminal Law and Sentencing Unit, and Fraser Goff, Parliamentary Council Office. Um, members should have their copies of the Bill, the Marshall List and Groupings Amendments beside you. And you also have a correction slip to the Marshall List, and that is on uh, Amendment 3. It's nothing enormous, it's simply that the word Act is repeated. If you look at it, it refers to the, the, the Section 1A of the Prison and Criminal Scotland Act 1993 Act. So that's all it is. Nothing, no great dynamite there. I, now I just uh, start away and I'll call Amendment 1 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary Group with Amendments 1A, 2, 3 and 4. Cabinet Secretary, please to move Amendment 1 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Uh, good morning, uh, Convener. Amendment 1 provides for the expansion of the policy so that the current entitlement to automatic early release at the two-thirds point of sentence is ended for all future long-term prisoners. This is in response to the comments made during Stage 1 that it was not clear why a differentiation was being made between sex offenders and non-sex offenders in the Bill on introduction. We consider our amendment is an appropriate response to the issues that were raised at Stage 1. Amendment 1 also provides for a minimum uh, six-month period of licence condition supervision for all long-term prisoners leaving custody. During Stage 1 scrutiny, it was suggested that an unintended consequence of ending the entitlement to automatic early release for certain prisoners was that some prisoners would serve their entire sentence in prison and then leave custody with no licence conditions in place to help supervise them in the community. Uh, this issue is commonly referred to as cold release. We discussed this at some length last week, and it is important to stress that the need for the operation of a mandatory period of licence condition supervision will apply to a limited proportion of long-term prisoners only. This is because many long-term prisoners will continue to receive pro board early release or will have an extended sentence in place. For example, we know that nearly half of sex offenders long-term prisoners uh, and approximately one-fifth of other long-term prisoners have an extended sentence. We also know a significant portion of long-term prisoners, especially non-sex offenders, receive discretionary release. For these prisoners, a period of supervision will always operate upon release from custody through the imposition of licence conditions. However, long-term prisoners not in this position will be subject to this period of six months licence condition supervision. It is important to explain what this means for sentences. A sentence will contain a period of time that must be served in custody at the start of the sentence. This will be half the sentence a period of time that must be served under supervision in the community at the end of the sentence. This will be the last six months, and a period in the middle of the sentence from the halfway point to the last six months that will be served either in custody or under supervision in the community if the prisoner is given parole early release. This is, in essence, a custodial and supervisory sentence. We are clear that the mandatory period of supervision should be part of a long-term prisoner's sentence. This will ensure there is effective enforcement of the conditions of the mandatory supervision period, which will include the ability to recall a prisoner to custody. As with the current system, it will be for the parole board to determine what the licence conditions should be. Various views have been expressed about what length the minimum supervision period should be. As I have explained, the minimum supervision period will only affect a limited portion of long-term prisoners, with supervision lasting much longer for many long-term prisoners with an extended sentence and those receiving discretionary early release. Keeping this in mind, we consider that the length of mandatory supervision should be six months. 
Members will be aware that a considerable amount of work goes on inside prisons to plan for the release of prisoners. For long-term prisoners, this includes criminal justice social work being directly involved inside prison to consider needs as a long-term prisoner becomes eligible for consideration of release. This work looks at ensuring the prisoner is ready, uh, as ready as they can be for release, including considering matters such as housing, welfare and work needs, given these are key to successful reintegration into the com community. All of this work is focused on the individual prisoner's needs uh, of that at that particular point and is done in prison ahead of release. We think the minimum period of supervision necessary for a prisoner serving close to four years as compared to a prisoner leaving after, say, eight years in custody is likely to be similar, given both are long, -term, long periods of time to be incarcerated and keeping in mind the additional preparatory work which is done in prison before release for all long-term prisoners. We do not support uh, Amendment 1A from Elaine Murray, which would set the supervision period at 12.5%. We do not consider someone serving, say, an eight-year sentence should have supervision that lasts twice as long as someone with a four-year sentence. That would be the effect of Elaine Murray's amendment. We have considered the evidence presented during Stage 1, which highlighted that it is the initial 6 to 12 weeks following release that are generally most crucial for individual prisoners. It is during these first weeks and months after leaving custody that prisoners have to re-establish themselves into communities, and this is when challenges around housing and getting a job will often be most acute. It is therefore at this point that a mandatory supervision period would be most appropriate. The Scottish Government considers that a period of six months strikes an appropriate balance so that mandatory supervision is in place for the crucial first few weeks and months following a long period of incarceration, but on the other hand does not leave licence conditions hanging over a prisoner too long as they leave custody and seek to reintegrate into the community. By the end of the six months, we consider prisoners will have had a sufficient opportunity to lay down routes back into the community and have established housing, welfare and work under close statutory supervision. It is important to stress that non-statutory support will continue once the six months has elapsed with community reintegration links laid down. We consider that, the, that where a prisoner is assessed as being dangerous that they should remain in custody as far as possible into their sentence before a period of supervision in the community operates. On this basis, we do not support Elaine Murray's Amendment 1A and we would ask the committee to support Amendment 1. If approved, Amendment 1 will mean that automatic early release is ended for all future long-term prisoners with an extended sentence and restricted to the last six months of sentence for those without an extended sentence. Amendment 2 operates in tandem with Amendment 1. As introduced, the Bill, will, uh, the bill, uh, the bill would have left uh, it to subordinate legislation to make provision about how the reforms to the early release system affect existing prisoners. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee expressed concern about the adequacy of the opportunity that would give members to scrutinise the important issue of how the reforms would affect prisoners serving sentences at the time of commencement. Amendment 1 would therefore make clear that the reforms do not affect prisoners already serving sentences when the new regime comes into force, and Amendment 2 removes the power for ministers to include savings and transitional provisions in subordinate legislation, as the job will have been done if Amendment 1 is approved. I am pleased that at its meeting last week, the Delegated Powers Committee welcomed what the Government had done in this respect. Amendment 3 is a minor amendment which allows for the commencement order to add in the specific date provision uh, were brought into force so that they appear in the relevant section of the 1993 Act. Uh, this should aid understanding of users of the 1993 Act. Amendment 4 is a minor change to the long title of the Bill. And I move Amendment 1. Thank you very much.
Uh, Elaine Murray, please, to move Amendment 1A and to speak to all the other amendments of the group, if okay. you wish. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'll, uh, I'll move my Amendment 1A, which I've introduced after the evidence session we had last week with Professors Tata and McNeil, uh, both of whom felt that uh, six months was insufficient in terms of a supervisory service uh, sentence for people who had served long-term sentences. Bear in mind that uh, the, the prisoner who has made the offender who has served, served an eight-year sentence at the end of that sentence, they have been that, that person who would be serving six months has been assessed as being too risky by the parole board to be released prior to that. And it would seem to me to be disproportionate for that person only to be supervised under licence in the community for a period of six months, particularly the longer sentence where a prisoner may be more institutionalised, uh, have gone through programmes or maybe not have gone through programmes, maybe have rejected some of the, the support they've been offered in prison uh, to only have that short a period. Uh, the professors actually argued that the supervisory part of the sentence should be at least 25%. I haven't gone as far as suggest 25%. Uh, the 12.5% I have suggested is not particularly evidence-based. It's really on the lines that I believe that you must have had some evidence that you thought six months was appropriate for somebody who'd served a four-year sentence. So that would allow somebody serving a four-year sentence to have the final six months uh, under supervision in the, in the community, but for it to to increase proportionately as the sentence length gets longer, reflecting perhaps the institutionalisation of prisoners, the fact that somebody who's serving a long sentence has probably uh, committed a more serious crime uh, and requires more effort in rehabilitation, and also taking into account the fact that because that person has not been released in parole, they are probably a particularly risky prisoner and requires a longer period of supervision uh, in the community. Um, as I say, I've put this here for discussion. I am pleased that the Cabinet Secretary used the term custodial supervisory sentences. I think we actually need to change the terminology uh, on sentencing so that we're not talking about automatic release, but we're talking about sentences which have two parts. And I think in, in, in both the Cabinet Secretary's amendment and my, my own amendment to that, that we are actually recognising that we need to take a more sophisticated attitude towards sentencing. But I would also say that in terms of the Stage 1 report, I think when the uh, Justice Committee made our recommendation, I think we were thinking that there would be a proportional element which would reflect the length of time somebody had served and the severity of the offence that they had committed, which I think a blanket six months doesn't actually do. Uh, thank you. Other members? I've got John, then I've got Roddy, then I've got Margaret, then I've got Christian, then I've got Gil. Um, thank you. Um, well, um, Elaine's comment there about a blanket um, doesn't serve individuals. Uh, I actually go along with it. I agree. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, if I noted you correctly, you talked about the criminal ju justice social work uh, activity within prisons. And, and if I noted you correctly again, you talked about individual prisoners' needs. You've also said about the initial six-week period being the most testing period. Uh, but I, I, you'll be familiar with the discussions that were last week and uh, uh, my use of the term risk assessment, perhaps, uh, um, how that would relate to an individual. And it's long established that to treat people equally doesn't mean you need to treat them the same. So, for instance, that six weeks will be far more compelling for someone who doesn't have housing than someone, perhaps, um, who served a long term uh, period who does have housing and a more stable background to go to. Um, I'm reassured when you say that there will be non-statutory uh, non support will continue after the six months, but what reassurance can you give me? Because the trouble I have, whether it's with the six months you propose uh, or any other version, is that um, it doesn't appear to take account of individual needs which will vary. So what reassurance can you give me that assessed needs of someone released from prison will be met if we agree that six months period, please? Right. Uh, Rod? Uh, I think the important point to, to remember is that 
that there are other prisoners other than the prisoners who can be affected by this bill, uh, i.e. prisoners who have been sentenced to a period of, of extended uh, supervision uh, at the time of uh, the, the uh, original imprisonment as set by the court, and indeed also all the prisoners who will have the opportunity of trying to obtain discretionary release uh, from the parole board. Um, so I think one thing that's slightly overlooked is the possibility that this new legislation will provide uh, an incentive uh, to people to try and cooperate and to try and obtain discretionary release, but I accept that there will still be people that fall through the net and uh, don't qualify for discretionary release. I've listened carefully to what Elaine said. I respect the intellectual argument she's making and indeed that of the distinguished academics, but I simply don't accept the argument that the longer you've been in prison, the longer you need to be supervised in the outside world. I agree that the period following release ought to be provided with a sort of proactive support in relation to accommodation, employment, education and benefits that Dr Barry talked about when she gave evidence on the 13th of January. But I don't think these are things that need to have a proportionate timetable. It was Colin McConnell, Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service, who said in evidence that the first six to 12 weeks after release can be extremely risky as people try to establish links and support in community space. That was accepted by the Cabinet Secretary. Even Fergus McNeil last week said that the Cap Cabinet Secretary was absolutely right that the first six weeks to three months are the critical period for establishing the basics for successful re resettlement when reintegration must be achieved. Although, of course, it's also fair to say that earlier in February he'd said that for public safety reasons and for reasons to do with the right of reintegration, it's critical that the system combines custodial sentences with post-release support. I accept what the Cabinet Secretary has said in terms of the terminology of this bill. Uh, I also accept the, that uh, there is an argument that, that individuals may become more institutionalised the longer they're incarcerated in prison, but I don't somehow think it should lead to a proportionate timetable. Uh, also, I bear, bear in mind that the plans of the Scottish Prisoner Service are to increase mentoring of prisoners approaching release and of an increase in the number of through care officers to 42. We heard evidence from Eric Much on that point, and these will be particularly targeted at offenders serving sentences of four years plus. So uh, all of these factors, together with the, the Cabinet Secretary's comments on the continuation of non-statutory support after six months, incline me to the view that the Cabinet Secretary has got the balance about right. Uh, our next one is Margaret, please. Good morning. Uh, you've made quite a point and an emphasis of the fact that this will only affect a small amount of, of prisoners, Minister. Um, but given these are some of the most difficult prisoners, other than hopefully um, thinking that maybe this will be an incentive for them to, um, to engage all of a sudden, what does your provision do that the original provisions didn't do at two-thirds um, release? It doesn't abolish automatic early release. It um, arguably leads for more risk in the community for difficult and potentially dangerous uh, prisoners to be less supervised for a smaller length of time. And also there seems to be the question of a possible challenge from HR for these prisoners are not being given the opportunity to provide they are not a risk for the community, a sufficient time to do that. Six months while it covers that initial period that we're told is the, the most frequent um, time when there are breaches, does manage to to look at housing, to maybe look at employment, but it doesn't mitigate the, the risk that can still be there. And I, I think it would be dangerous to underestimate that. So I'm genuinely, Minister, puzzled as to what the bill actually does achieve. All right. Um, I'll give you the opportunity to come back with them all at the summing up. I've now got Christian. If you wish, but I think it's probably the better way to do it. Is that correct? Do you want to answer that? Come I'll back? certainly try my best uh, <laughs> to cover as many of the issues well, as I can. We know you'll try your best, not your worst. Christian, next, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Convener. Uh, just to come into the, the one, I know the Cabinet Secretary talked about the cold release, but there is another point which may be not talked about as well why this military period came into force. It was the evidence that we received which said that there is an increasing number of prisoners opting to max out their sentences. That's a very important point. You know, not only that 
the six-month period is not only to stop cold release, but is as well that new things that we didn't know about, uh, this maxing out of sentences of prisoners has to be addressed. And I think, you know, the amendment just, just, just addressed that. What was this cabinet secretary bring to in, front of, in front of us just addressed this? Regarding the period, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that Ellen Murray said it's not evidence-based. It's difficult to have evidence-based for the 12.5 percent or 25 percent. And where I come from, I, you know, I was quite happy to see that the Scottish uh, Association for the Care and Resettlement of, of Offenders, uh, SACRO, uh, talked about the three months, because to me, three months is what we talked about, the first weeks and the first month, uh, which are the most important. So I was quite happy with three months. But I, I, I'm happy to go with the cabinet history, extending it to, to six months. But to my mind, you know, Again, I agree with John Finney when you talk about proportionality. Proportionality is not so much the, the amount of sentences that you be given, but it should be more individual based. I'm quite happy. I was quite happy with three months, but I'd be quite happy with six months for, for, for long-term prisoners. And let's not forget, it's not only it's not all long-term prisoners, but it's only the one uh, 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 who have not having the discretionary early release, who have not having uh, uh, the extending sentences uh, uh, with, with under supervision. So I'm quite. I, I, maybe the cabinet secretary can reflect on what John Finney is, is proposing. I, I wouldn't think that it should be on the face of the bill, but maybe having an individual approach, uh, making un understanding that it's not about proportionality of the, of the length of sentences, but the quality of the work done in the six months should be really uh, regarded about the individual more, 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 more than anything else. Thank you. Gil? Thank you very much. Can I speak on uh, Elaine uh, Murray's uh, Amendment 1A? I, I, I see this just as a, another form of aut automatic early release. Uh, it's just simply change the parameters. Um, you know, and if you take, uh, it's measured by the, the time served, and if you take a five-year sentence, it, if my calculation is right, it equates to 142 days early release. And then if you go to 14 years, it's 398 days uh, uh, early release. So it seems to me that effectively the most dangerous uh, people get the most benefit in terms of being uh, serving a shorter sentence. Uh, and, and that seems to be kind of wrong in my view. And to be quite honest, we, we, either, we either want to end early release or we don't. And I think this is just another form of it. And for that reason, I'll... I wouldn't be supporting it. Alison. I, I too want to speak to Amendment 1A. Um, I mean, certainly in our Stage 1 report, we, we spoke about the need for there to be a mandatory period of supervision. And I was grateful that the Minister listened to that and came back with, with a suggestion of three months. And I think all that we took, six months, sorry, all that we spoke about round about the Stage 1 report was should it be three months, should it be six months, should it be a year? Uh, the issue of proportionality and the way that Elaine is addressing really only arose last week when we took, took some evidence and, and, and granted. Um, it was vociferous evidence, but uh, the, the figure of 12.5% seems to have been plucked from the air. Uh, Elaine, you yourself said this morning that it's not particularly evidence-based, and therefore on that basis it's, it's really quite hard um, to support it. You, you haven't addressed the additional cost of a longer period of supervision, so I'm, I'm not sure about the impact of that. And I'm aware um, the SHRC have expressed concerns about long um, unduly long license, periods of license supervision um, and, and, and talked about the restrictive nature of that and the interference with public life and the need for it to be proportionate. Um, we've heard from other people that actually the time on license is a very stressful time um, and that we should just be proportionate about that. So I, I, I think on the basis that it's not particularly been well evidenced then I can't support the amendment. Yes, um, I, I would very much support what Alison has just said because I think the key word was used as 12.5%. I appreciate it's not evidence-based. And the evidence that we had was 6 to 12 weeks was required, and that was the, the danger time for uh, people being released. And this is to do with rehabilitation and supervision. It's a period that is required to do that. It's not a proportion of the sentence that's given. And if the evidence that we had said that six to 12 weeks is the danger zone, I think six months 
satisfies that on the evidence that we've had. My issue with yours, as you said yourself, is you've got this figure, as you say, plucked from the air. We had no evidence on 12.5%, therefore I can't support it, I'm afraid. Now, I now move to... Um, I'm busy speaking, I forgot to do next. Cabinet Secretary to wind up, first of all, on the Euro Amendment uh, 1, and if you wish, of course, to comment on the other um, relation to 1A. Thank you, Convener, and I'm grateful to the members for their uh, comments on this matter, some of which we discussed at previous sittings of the, uh, the committee in considering this issue. I was uh, conscious that in the course of Elaine Murray's uh, contribution that the witnesses you received last week will be neither satisfied with my proposal or our own proposal in this matter, given the position which they've taken on the issue of automatic early release. Uh, so um, I, I do recognise uh, their view in this matter, but I'm also uh, conscious of the other evidence which the committee has received, and that is that uh, that crucial period of the 6 to 12 week period when a prisoner is released back into the community as being uh, the critical time in helping to reintegrate and to re-establish uh, a prisoner back into uh, the community. Also in your earlier evidence you heard from SACRO where it was a period of three months that they thought was a reasonable period of time in which to undertake that work to those who thought it should be six, nine or possibly as long as a year. So there is a variety of views out there on what is the most appropriate uh, uh, length of time and we have tried to strike a balance based upon the evidence which the committee has heard over the course of the uh, stage one consideration of uh, this bill. Can I turn to some of the specific points which have been raised? And I think uh, John Finney raised a very important point in that it was much more about the uh, quality rather than the quantity of the time at that period of uh, supervision uh, takes place. Um, I think that's absolutely key uh, in order to helping to secure the reintegration of prisoners back into uh, community. That's why uh, we have uh, the ministerial group that I chair on reintegration of prisoners, which is looking at how we can improve the joined up nature of what goes on in prison within our communities as well, in order to build those bridges much more effectively. Uh, and that's around housing, it's around welfare, it's around employment. And as committee members will be aware, there are a range of measures that can be taken for long-term prisoners before they move into the community. So, for example, some of them may be granted um, uh, at release in order to start employment opportunities. Some of them can move to the open estate if that is viewed as being the most appropriate way in which to manage their move towards release, being released from the prison estate and back into the community in order to reintegrate them. So I think it's important in considering the time frame at the end of the sentence that this is part of what is also the work that's been taking place within prison and where that particular prisoner may actually be given the assessment that is made of their particular needs at that uh, given time. And that's why that individual uh, uh, approach is extremely important and why the Scottish Prison Service are now placing so much emphasis on the through care officers who have that type of responsibility in building up the picture of what's needed for that individual prisoner in order to put those building blocks in place in order to manage their offending behaviour and also their move back into the community much more effectively. But there is more we can do in that than the ministerial group that I chair is very much focused on how we can achieve that more effectively in going uh, forward. Uh, and some of the pilot work that I've mentioned previously to the committee around housing and creating those links is all about achieving exactly uh, that type of um, approach. Can I also say that um, um, uh, Margaret Mitchell's um, uh, points around uh, she's not entirely sure um, what my amendment does that the bill doesn't do. Uh, clearly what my amendment does is creates that statutory period of community supervision uh, because of the crucial period from the evidence that you've heard about that 6 to 12 week period about making sure there is a mandatory period of supervision there to manage those prisoners into the community. The concern that you heard from a range of stakeholders was the risks associated with cold release Prisoners who would be released back into the community with no period of mandatory supervision. And what the bill seeks to do is to make sure that there is that period of mandatory community supervision. So that if there are concerns, if the person it does find themselves uh, in a situation where they are struggling, is that there is a structure in place in order to address that. That, in my view, is about trying to manage a risk much more effectively. If there is a risk... 
uh, to the community, the risk is that there is no support there for that individual and that they may end up committing another offence. I would prefer to be in a position where we were providing the right type of support in order to minimise that potential risk uh, within uh, the community. And that is why it is extremely important, I believe, that we have that minimum period as based on the evidence that you have heard from a range of stakeholders at the end of a prisoner's sentence in order to support them and reintegrate them back into the community. And as I have mentioned, we believe that reasonable period of time in order to get that right and to provide the right quality of support is that six-month period. Thank you very much, Secretary. Elaine Murray to wind up Amendment 1A, press or withdraw. Right, th uh, thanks very much, Convener. Can I first of all address the point that Gail Patterson made, which says that my amendment would be wouldn't end automatic early release. If you want to look at it from that angle, neither my amendment nor the Cabinet Secretary's amendments actually end automatic early release because somebody would be automatically released six months before the end of their sentence or 12.5% before the end of their sentence. So if you want to look at it in that way, neither of them do, does that. But my suggestion is that we, we move away from that sort of interpretation. We look at the, the balance between the custodial sentence and the community part of a sentence in terms of what, what produces uh, the best results. Um, I heard what John Finney was saying about assessments around individual needs. The only problem, I think, with that is that if somebody rejects the assessment, somebody may be assessed who gets out only six months before the end of a long sentence, and if they reject the requirement for additional support thereafter, at the end of the six months, there is no... There is nothing compelling them. They are compelled for that six months to, to accept the assistance, but they are not compelled thereafter. So if somebody does need a longer period, it does not actually guarantee that they will get a longer period uh, of support. In terms of the 12.5%, as I said, I, that figure I used in order to stimulate debate, I, I selected it because it equated to six months at four years, uh, and I presume that the Cabinet Secretary had some evidence that he felt that six months was the appropriate period of time at four years. So it's, it, it's, uh, uh, it was chosen on that basis, although, as he said, uh, the professors who came to speak to us last week would be satisfied with neither uh, sets of amendments because they were actually arguing for uh, at least 25%, which would, to be honest, not be terribly different to the situation which we're at at the moment. I think they made some, in their evidence to us, they made some other points which actually probably go beyond the scope of this bill but which need to be considered. Um, I am content not to press the amendment uh, at this stage, having listened to what colleagues have said. I will consider it, and in, hopefully in the period before we have stage three, there will be the opportunity to receive other evidence from other stakeholders which may inform any amendment which I brought forward, forward at stage three, but I'm quite happy not to press it at this stage. Do you wish to withdraw? I know withdraw. Um, she wishes well. That, does any member object? No member objects. The question is, therefore, that amendment one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Abstentions? 8-4, none against, one abstention. The amendment is agreed to. The question is that Section 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 5 in the name of Margaret Mitchell and a group in its own. Margaret, please, to move and speak to that amendment. Thank you, Convener. I move Amendment 3 in my name. Despite the Cabinet Secretary's valiant attempts to try and justify the evidence, um, this bill, on the evidence that we heard from Stage 1, and also on the supplementary evidence following the Scottish Government Stage 2 amendments, really only confirm that it, it isn't fit for purpose. The original policy memorandum states that the bill ends the system of automatic release for certain prisoners in the interest of protecting public safety. But the government proposed changes at stage two do not end automatic early release. Hence the change to the long title uh, proposed, which will now refer to amending the rules as to automatic early release for long-term prisoners. So the Cabinet Secretary amendment merely replace automatic early release at the two-thirds point of a sentence with automatic early release at six months before completion of that sentence. 
This has proportionality implications, which in turn may well lead to a potential HR challenge. The government has not made the case as to why it rejected the proportionate approach. I don't think they've made that case adequately at all. The six to eight weeks, yes, that is the key area for reoffending. Um, up to six months allows that prisoner to be resettled, to look at housing, to look at benefits, but it doesn't address a potential um, risk to the public from what could be a very difficult um, prisoner being released at that point. Nor does the bill, even after being amended, um, provide clarity in sentencing for the public or improve public safety. Given all of this, it's hard to work out what the government is attempting to achieve with the introduction of this bill. The inevitable conclusion is that this was bad legislation to begin with and that the Scottish government's attempt to address stakeholders' extensive and legitimate criticisms at stage two have muddied the waters further and made things worse. Furthermore, given the extremely narrow scope of the Prisoner Control of Release Scotland Bill, it's quite simply not possible to alter it in an attempt to ensure that it does become fit for purpose. That poses, I contend, an insurmountable problem for us as a scrutiny committee, which is why I have lodged this probing amendment, which seeks to delay and it's probing at this stage, uh, the commencement. I notice people are laughing at that, so maybe no, I shouldn't I, have a probing amendment. <laughs> no, maybe I'll just I, consider it once we've heard the, the, the reports, because this is far too serious, I think, to be de dealt with flippantly, uh, Mr. Campbell. Oh, uh, I, I don't think. I think it's unfair. I, I think if we just proceed on, Margaret, we're doing a so good job. So I've lodged this it. amendment which seeks to delay the commencement of Section 1 until the day after the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2015 receives royal assent. This would provide the committee and the Cabinet Secretary with breathing space to look at the criminal justice system in the round, including short term sentencing early release and associated recidivism rates. It would crucially also provide the opportunity for the thoughtful, helpful and constructive suggestions proposed by Professor Tata and McNeil and Dr Barry, which have been sent to the committee following the, per the professor's pertinent and forensic criticisms of the bill when they gave evidence last Wednesday to be taken into account and properly considered. The issue of automatic early release, which is confusing for the public and vexing for victims of crimes and their families, is far too important to tinker with rather than giving it the consideration it deserves to get it absolutely right. I look forward to the Cabinet Secretary's response. Margaret, um, any other members wish to? Elaine and Rod. Um, yes. I'm I appreciate uh, some of Margaret's concerns, which certainly are reflecting some of the evidence that we had. However, there are two things I think which I'm not really sure about. I'm not quite sure how I know that the amendments were originally, or these proposals were originally supposed to be amendments to the Criminal Justice Bill, but I'm not sure that the rest of the Criminal Justice Bill interacts in any particular way with this bill, which means that they, this bill can't come into effect until that bill has come into effect because they are, this was a bit, to a certain extent an add-on to that bill. So I'm not sure how delaying implementation would actually be required or, or is required in, in, in terms of that bill. And the other thing is if, if there are issues with, about which we are so concerned about this bill, I don't see how they can be addressed in the criminal justice bill or there's anything very much that we could do about them through the passage of that bill. I mean, they may some of the issues brought to us by the professors and so on, I think, are probably for reflection on in, fu in future legislation um, rather than um, in the Criminal Justice Bill when it comes back to us in, in the autumn. So I'm grateful to Margaret for bringing this to us so that we can reflect on it, but I'm not convinced that that delay is required in terms of the passage of this bill. Rod. I don't really have anything to add beyond what Elaine has said, actually, about the, the, uh, the points in relation to uh, delay. Um, I, uh, why I'm supportive is because we've, we've really tackled what was a huge issue for us, was cold release. And that really was the key for me in doing this, is that we have management of uh, rehab and supervision 
within the context of the prison, but more importantly that that transition continues out into the community. And I think for me that deals with what legitimately raised about risk of you know, really long-term prisoners. Well, that's, that, at least now there's a six-month period when they must it's mandatory that there's supervision and rehabilitation uh, in that supportive period. So um, I, I, I think that this is something I don't want to see delayed. Um, anyone else? Right. Um, I'm now going to call John. Sorry, John. Yes. Uh, no, uh, uh, it's just a reflection um, uh, for Margaret. Um, I, I certainly don't support her amendment, but I, I do support the scrutiny role that this committee undertakes. And I think for the reasons that the convener said, we have seen movement. Now, in life, none of us get what we want all the time. But, you know, the consensual way that we've got, uh, got to the point where we have, where we have seen movement from the Scottish Government, I think, you know, we commend the Government on that and I think commend it this committee for its work, if indeed can commend ourselves. If you, know what I mean. <laughs> you go and commend yourself, John, <laughs> as you don't get everything that you want in life. We're already feeling sorry for you. Get an extra muffin. Uh, <laughs> Cabinet, <laughs> Gil. Yeah, I think committees maybe missed uh, section two of this bill, which is very appropriate, and I wouldn't like any delays. The idea that someone presently gets released in a day that they can't get any services is just yes, madness. No, and so, point. you know, th th this is an excellent part. A tidying up exercise nope. should have been done a lot Well ago. said. We'd forgotten and about lots, that bit. Lots, yes. lots of people. I'm coming back to you. I'm coming back to you. Yeah. Wait, we're coming yeah. back to you when you sum up. Sorry. Yes. Thanks very much. I don't interrupt with anyone else. Um, and I don't blame you for that. But, you know, there's a lot of people in really poor circumstances that need help will benefit from this simple, straightforward a, a part of the bill. Thank you very much. No, Margaret, you get to sum up. So I now go to the Cabinet Secretary, then I come back to you, Margaret. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Kevira. I've listened carefully to what uh, Margaret Mitchell has said about Amendment 5 as to why she seeks to delay the commencement of these important reforms uh, pending parliamentary approval uh, of the Criminal Justice uh, Bill and Royal Assent being received for that particular bill. Uh, at present, there is no provisions contained within the Criminal Justice Bill relating to early release, and we do not see any reason for delaying commencement of this Bill in the manner that would result, in, would result from uh, Amendment 5 being agreed to. It is appropriate that any Stage 2 amendments to the Criminal Justice Bill should be considered by the Committee during the Bill Stage 2 uh, process. Uh, amending this Bill to tie it into future legislation would be to preempt Parliament's consideration of the Criminal Justice Bill, and I don't believe that that's appropriate. It is worth noting uh, that Margaret Mitchell's amendments to the Criminal Justice Bill will provide for a system of cold release for long-term prisoners. This is, of course, precisely what members of the committee have just voted against. In any event, uh, Parliament will have the chance to consider Margaret Mitchell's amendments when Stage 2, two of the Criminal Justice Bill takes place. Uh, and while I've listened to my, what Margaret Mitchell has had to say in this matter, we do not consider that it is good, there is any good justification for delaying this important piece of legislation and the contents of this bill until after the Royal Assent of the Criminal Justice Bill. And on that basis, I would ask the Committee to reject Amendment 5. Margaret. The point of information that I, I wanted to make was that Section 2 under my mention still goes ahead. So, that, um, doing your summing up, you see. Yeah, yes. Well, I thought it was um, something that was explaining exactly what the amendment does. I think there's a bit of confusion about what's um, being proposed here. It's a breathing space. It's a breathing space in what has been a very tight um, scrutiny period to turn the bill upside down, which was bad to begin with, which has been improved slightly, but still isn't fit for purpose. And as a scrutiny committee, I'm dealing with one of the most important issues in the, um, the criminal justice system, I think it is sensible and reasonable that, that we could consider taking advantage of that period of time to look at not least the very significant evidence that was presented last week by um, the academics and the two professors who brought up very relevant forms. 
So I, I firmly believe, and you know, as for my amendment in the criminal justice um, bill, they'll be tested. It could be a probing amendment, it could be looking at how it goes. I think it's quite wrong to fixate on that. What I do think it's important is that it allows this time up until and during the consideration of that bill to look at where we're going with um, this bill. So I b firmly believe that that's the, the best way forward to delay commencement of Section 1 to ensure the best possible outcome from scrutiny of the Criminal Justice Bill, not least to ensure that the period of mandatory supervised release in the commu community is sufficient and properly thought through to address the practicalities, and that's housing, benefits, employment, things that aren't addressed, and I have to say I don't have a great amount of confidence will be in the future and through care on past um, experience, and that these are actually adequately resourced to ensure the essential criminal justice social work is in place and supported by a level of surveillance using all the modern technology available in accordance with the assessment of risk. These are important bits, important bits of the jigsaw, which I think we should have time to consider to get this bill right. I won't press uh, my amendment today because it is to air these and it's to hope that genuinely the Cabinet Secretary who has a good tra track record to date on listening to concerns about legislation and proposals championed by his predecessor will reflect on the advantage of delaying commencement of Section 1 and support this amendment at a later stage. You seek to withdraw, Margaret. I do. Uh, does anyone object? There's no objection. I therefore call Amendment 2 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Not agreed. Right. There will be. Sorry, I'm moving too fast for Margaret. So Amendment 2. The question is Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Abstentions. 8 4, none, not against, and 1 abstention. That amendment is agreed to. Call Amendment 3 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debate Amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I heard uh, out there, there's a <laughs> it's not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Abstentions. 8 4, none against, 1 abstention. That amendment is therefore agreed to. The question is that section 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that section 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call amendment 4 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated amendment 1. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Not agreed. Sorry. Not agreed. That's not agreed. There will never be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Abstentions. 8 4, not against, 1 abstention. That, that amendment is therefore agreed to. The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That ends stage 2 consideration of the bill. Thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary, your official is for attending today. Thank you. I'll suspend for a couple of minutes. Thank you. Now move on to item three, Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights. Members are aware that John Finney is a rapporteur on the SNAP plan on human rights, and today John will update us on his latest meeting, Professor Alan Miller, Chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission. John, I invite you to update the committee, please. Uh, thank you, Convener. I don't know the extent to which you wish me to, to go into that. I mean, the paper has been, uh, I can make perhaps some general comments. Um, First of all, very grateful to Professor Alan Muller, who is a very busy man, not just in respect of human rights in Scotland, but as you know, in the European and indeed international stage where he he's, uh, holds various positions. We discussed the, the Scotland's National Action Plan, which is, is uh, the focus of, of a lot of the work there, and, and under 
some of the, the items five there, you'll notice that culture has featured, and uh, the phrase innovations forums to identify opportunities to empower people to understand and use their rights. And I know from engagement with uh, um, some groups that historically people haven't seen human rights as being particularly relevant to them, but in a variety of fields, so for instance health and social care and issues around welfare and care homes and the right to dignity and um, you know, s simple things like levels of hydration, these are fundamental human rights. Um, the justice system, um, we heard last week um, the, the statement on historic child abuse and clearly the Scottish Human Rights Commission have been involved in that and uh, as you know are regular um, respondents to calls for evidence from uh, this committee. Um, there's also been involved um, with the, the police service who contribute to Scotland's National Action Plan and people will be aware that the Human Rights Commission have uh, engaged on issues like uh, human rights training at the Scottish Police College. Um, and, and I think it's fair to record that there's been discussions on some of the um, issues around, for instance, stop and search and questions of proportionality. And I think it's good that the Scottish Human Rights Commission can be seen as um, sort of honest brokers in the scheme of things, and um, people are very willing to engage with them. Um, the planning for a disability summit in 2015 and the publication of a draft report and Driverly plan um, is another issue that, that was discussed. Um, I provided some information in the, the work of the, the committee and the, the, the Justice Subcommittee on Policing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and um, uh, these included issues that like human uh, trafficking and the fatal accident inquiries and, and the scrutiny role that the committees provide. Um, and I certainly um, said that on behalf of the committee, I'd be very happy to keep in touch with Professor Miller um, on the issue of any emerging issues. And, and I think it's fair to record that one of these emerging issues, regardless of where it sits at the moment, is the, the, the difference between the position in the, the rest of the UK and Scotland regarding human rights and the discussion and debate that's to be had around that. Um, so I, I'm very happy to answer any specific questions. Come here. I don't know if Dungavel falls within the SNAP action plan, but obviously I've raised the issue in part, and other members have raised the issue about the failure to allow um, welfare to go in and check on the condition of people detained there who are after all not criminals uh, and indeed um, the trade unions, STUC and others. Does that something falls within your discussions with Professor Miller? Does he have any remit there? Because it seems to me, while well, technically of course Dungavel is UK in a detention, it's on Scottish soil. Yes, indeed. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say that we, we, we didn't discuss that particular issue, but I'm happy to Would engage with it? Professor Miller on that because clearly, as you say, historically there's been issues about particularly children and young people. That um, got dealt with, if I recall, through the previous Children's Commissioner, that children are not detained there now. Yes, indeed, they're at Yarlswood, as I understand. Yes, um, but um, that's and, England, of course, um, yeah. But, of course, only last week we saw a, a raid there where there was children involved with yes. the UK Border Agency. So, I mean, I'm happy to discuss what role, if any, there is for the... I'm talking about the adults, because children are not detained at Dungavel anymore. That we, they, we dealt a blow to that, I think. Y yes, indeed. Yes, so, indeed. Uh, through the previous Children's Commissioner, who, who really took this on board. Now, as she succeeded there... I'm wondering why, notwithstanding that it's a UK institution within Scotland, the human rights, uh, com the human rights uh, uh, professor Miller C Commissioner can't deal the same thing for adults, you know, on the principle that it was prevented previously, well, even just to let people in to see the welfare of the detainees. Yes, well, indeed, I, I visited there in the past, and, and I've written and asked to visit again, and I've been told that that's inappropriate. Um, so, I mean, I can certainly speak to Professor Miller about yes. that, and also the Equality and Human Rights Commission, who are the UK body as well. So, I, I mean, I'm happy to pick up on that and report to I don't know if other meeting. members share my concerns about that. I mean, to have people uh, detained, they're no, not even to go and see how their welfare is, or they have no time for them. We've just dealt with um, control of release of prisoners. These people don't even know when they're going to either be um, accepted within the community or sent back. Um, I mean, it seems to me just inhuman. Um, are you content that this is raised, mm -hmm. human rights? Okay, okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask, oh, just something I want to ask is nobody put their name forward, was I'm very interested in the case studies. I, I dispute with you now that people aren't aware of human rights. I think they've become increasingly aware well, no, I was saying that of their human yeah, rights no, now, yes, the public. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in the case studies 
Um, is this the Health Committee that's dealing with that under the pilot projects? Y yes, indeed, it is to go to the Health Committee. Uh -huh. yeah. Do we know anything else about it, what, what it's dealing with? Is it, do we know what these case studies are? Uh, there, there was no specific information on that, uh -huh. but could, I understand could, it's imminent because it is, um, as you see, it's June this month that they yes. are to go to the Health Committee. Quite interested to see what, how, you know, how people, are, if it's the way they're treated in hospital and so on, don't know. I'd like to know more about that, so maybe if we could... Uh, yeah, I'll certainly do that you. and report back. Was it Rod you wanted in? Yeah, no, just to put clarification, there's a reference to an action plan on justice for victims of historic child abuse. With the appointment of Susan O'Brien last week, is, yes. are you able to comment and, uh, in any way about SHRC's kind of involvement or otherwise in this issue? Well, well, well the appointment was uh, subsequent to me meeting with Professor yeah. Miller. Uh, however, um, he, uh, I think there was a, an awareness there was going to be an announcement. And of course, the Scottish Human Rights Commission acted as go-between and did, did sterling work getting um, people who had been in conflict around a, a table to, to discuss issues and how to take things forward. So I'm sure there will be further updates from, and, and again, I can come back to the committee with that. That would be helpful to know. Yes, thank you. Elaine? Yes, thank you, convener. I'm actually dispute with the convener for disputing with John Fenney that people don't know about their human rights. <laughs> <laughs> because actually, uh, I don't know that people are really aware of what their human rights are, what human rights is actually about. I think a lot of what people read in the papers is about offenders and all sorts of uh, people they might consider to be undesirable folk and then maybe don't realise what human rights actually means for everybody. And so I think the, geez, the innovation for forms, particularly if there are discussions at the UK level about repealing the Human Rights Act, I think it's extremely important that people are made aware of the whole gamut of human rights and how actually it benefits all of us. If I may just respond and say uh, they're more aware of their human rights. Not everybody is, but certainly in my inbox, quite a lot of people are aware of human rights. Sorry, well, John. I, 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 think, I think it's an issue, and it. it's, it's not a party political issue. It is an issue about the growing yes. diversity of views. You know, whilst it's been promoted very positively and picked up by the Scottish Government, um, the, the Scotland's National, and, indeed, all the, yes, on, on a cross party basis. Um, there, there, there is um, some negative PR about the whole concept elsewhere in these aisles. Jane. Just to, to get back to the, the issue about health and social care convener, I, I'm remembering what was told to us yesterday about the, the incidence of, of mental health yes. issues and, and the problems that the police face in, in dealing with that. But um, So for, if, if, if health and social care is going to be a pilot project, I would like mental health to be a specific of that. Mm. And it's not just hospitals, it's about community-based services and, and, and the, the, the integration board in particular, I think what they're doing so, um, more specifically about mental health than, than just the broad heading of, of health. Uh, again, um, Professor Murrell didn't go into detail about this because it is exclusively for the health committee, but I can confirm that. I, I would be very surprised if mental health, which quite often features in, in terms of rights issues, um, weren't part of it, but I can confirm that and come back to committee. Okay, let me just clarify, the case studies to be considered by the Parliament, these, these have not been set up yet, am I correct? No, no, it's to, to be considered by the Health Committee this month. So, yes. set, so I think we could perhaps just make a comment, or if yeah. you make a comment on our behalf, yeah. that we want mental health yes, uh, to be That'd included be in it, yeah. I think that would be something. Yeah. Okay. Christian? Culture, but it's a series of innovation forums to identify opportunities to empower people to understand and use their rights. Uh, do we know if any of these innovation forums will, uh, will talk about what uh, uh, this committee is doing, uh, particularly talking about you know, nobody should, uh, should be ignorant of the law, but to a certain extent, a lot of people who just settle in this country will have big problems to understand what their rights are. Will that will come under uh, this program of innovation forums? Can we know more about these innovation forums? Well, the particular example cited was from the north of Ireland, and indeed it was um, in regarding housing regeneration in North Ireland uh, in Belfast, where the community were empowered to make decisions. And they uh, fed that information into um, a, a, an event which occurred in Glasgow and to coincide with uh, World Human Rights Day in December last year. And it is picking up in community empowerment issues, and it is picking up on the point that Elaine made there about people having an awareness of how rights um, can be used yes. to, to support decision making and how they should be embedded into um, policy decisions and uh, well, well, I said, uh, understanding the law as well. Uh, 
uh, no, no, knowing your right, you know, under, under, under the justice system? Well, the, the, I personally raised at the police subcommittee the issue of that information being made available by the police because I think it's in the police interest for people to understand their rights. And I commended a booklet which was issued in the police force I was in many, many years ago. And I think we were assured by the Assistant Chief Constable that is information that would be made away, available online to encourage young people, particularly pertinent with regard to um, stop and search and individuals knowing their rights and entitlements. But I, 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 I would certainly support um, a wider teaching of human rights because too often they're seen by the establishment as being threats rather than something that we all have an opportunity to benefit from. It would be good to, if you can come back to us and let us know the innovation forums in Norwich. Right. Which I'll certainly. Have it, if yeah. you can. I just note also that, yes, SNAP are uh, um, observing training programmes on human rights issues at the police college for, for a start now. Yes. Maybe it's your wee book. Uh, it would be nice if it was the wee book, yeah. <laughs> yeah nice book. Right. Um, can I thank you for that? Now, it's a very interesting discussion. Um, and I now move into private session. <laughs>